Good evening and welcome back to another edition of Vaping in the Mic. This evening we have a lady, I'm going to show you something. She sent me a list of things that she has accomplished or gotten done this year. And I'm going to tell you something. This, this is astounding. It's in a Word document and she started it at the beginning of the year. And she is from the Heartland Institute. She works on all kinds of things for tobacco harm reduction, for vaping you name it okay but this is just a list of things that she has accomplished and i'm going to scroll down through it rather quickly because i'm going to tell you something it's 31 pages long and this is just from the beginning of the year and folks we're talking from different states in february talking about new mexico bill analysis you get into the 14th in new york and the bills that are going on in new york utah i mean this thing is massive massive long massively complex and how she keeps up with it all i absolutely have no idea but the person i'm talking about if you would welcome is of course lindsey straub lindsey how you doing this evening i'm fantastic how are you i have no idea man <laughs> I'm just, I am surrounded by all kinds of electronics and programs and Lord knows what. So if my PC starts to crap out here in a little bit, people will know why. Um, just real quick, yeah, I'm on a Mac CPU. Real quick, the phone lines are open tonight. If you have a question as we are going along, please feel free to call the number right there on the screen, 215-383-5752. You can press 1 when you hear the announcement come on. It'll show up in a little screen that I've got over here, and I can get you connected over to Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay, let me ask you, in, in this document that I'm looking at, how long does it take you to go and through this? I mean, this thing's huge. Well, it's a compilation. I, I have a week of working documents, which is in, do a lot of outlining um, on what I work on. So that was just going through all of those weeks and copying and pasting the vaping and tobacco related ones because I do cover other issue areas. But yeah, no, it is. Um, I mean, you, there's a lot of bills out there and you just want to try to find as much information as you can um, and, you know, read through the bill, um, especially when it comes to, you know, taxes or even regulating um, these products, there's a lot, there's not any cohesion um, among all the states. It's just, I was glancing through that and I'm, I'm, I'm baffled because folks, if you think that is something, what we're gonna get into and talk to here in a little bit is the yeah. the Excel sheet that she works on. And, and that is just mind boggling. How you yeah. keep up with that sometimes is beyond my understanding now if you would for the people that may not know who you are you work for the heartland institute what do you do there i'm a state government relations manager and i'm still working on them to let me be a policy analyst um seeing as much as i'm covering tobacco related issues but um so i've been you know in light of or in lieu of uh, our well in addition to following all the tobacco related um bills and legislation going on i keep a track of about 16 different states where i send out our communications follow track other bills in our wheelhouse we do cover you know I mean, we're known for tobacco and climate change but we do cover budget and tax energy and environment health care constitutional reform so making oh sure God. that lawmakers are educated e educated she says she and i were talking before we came on yes. live and she was telling me a couple of horror stories education does not even cover what these people need yeah. and and she said it it can you relate the one about the jewel pod without using any names um yeah the um so um 
what you were talking about when we were in Indiana that I was talking about. And yeah. so in the committee hearing, Senate Appropriations Committee hearing, and um, one of the um, witnesses um, on our side actually came comes up and she has her mod and then she has packs of jewel pods. And to watch these lawmakers, I mean, you could tell on their face, they're like, what the hell is that? You know, they kind of like, you know, short of turning their neck over and like, you know, being like, what is that? Um, you could see that they had really no idea about the different generations of, you know, e-cigarettes. Um, I would really think like to take, you know, go to a hearing myself and um, bring a cigarette, bring a cig like bring, you know, one of the smaller personalized vapors, bring a mod, bring a jewel pod, maybe even bring a weed pen if it's like, if it's legal in that state. And like, oh, by the way, this is what that looks like too, just so they know the different type of types of products that are out there. It, it, that that floored me when they're taking a look at pods, jewel pods, and they're like, "What's that?" I, I I'm baffled because they want to pass legislation on something that they have absolutely no effing clue on at yeah. all. They just jump on a bandwagon. Do these folks just listen to like the worst of Fox News or something? I mean, where did uh, well, they get their information? Well, I mean, when the Surgeon General calls it an epidemic, they feel like they need to do something about it. Um, that's really kind of the gist of it. When I was in North Dakota talking to the legislators, they're like, well, our public health department said, you know, that they have formaldehyde in it. And I'm like, oh, my God, you know, popcorn <laughs> lung. I got to ask that question. I had to refrain from being like, that's so 2016. Yeah. Um, but it, there's just a lot of misinformation. Plus, you know. A lot of lawmakers don't smoke. You, I mean, it's not the good old days. I mean, even in the, I, I worked for a Republican congressman. I interned in 2012, and they were anti-smoking. And I, I was kind of taken aback. I'm like, you're Republican. What do you mean? Okay, but um, to them, they don't. They, it's I don't know if I don't know if it's they don't care about the smokers or if they just don't understand because they're not a smoker themselves. It, I don't think that they really have a large understanding. It, if anybody has had the ability, um, either last week or the week before, Dimitri Agriofiotis had a rant that he did in the car when he was driving back from looking at legislation at their capital in Tennessee. And the listening to that, it shows that the people there were absolutely clueless. It, it was yeah. amazing. You know, they and and here again on the other side of the aisle, here's Jewel pressing for T21 and a per mill tax. Yep. Dimitri turned around, and my understanding, he said, Why don't we just? He explained to them, if you do that kind of a tax, it'll be three dollars on a 60 mil and only four cents on the actual product that you're trying to get rid of or to moderate from youth use and they didn't understand until we talked about it he goes why don't we go ahead and tax the actual milligrams of nicotine in the product and jewel had a cow they were not happy oh, about yeah. that because well, here again they're they're sitting at 50 48.7 milligrams or thereabout yeah and it's actually not just jewel um all the uh all the tobacco companies that have e-cigarette products, um, they all are closed pod systems that, you know, they're not going to be impacted by a per milliliter tax. Um, what's unfortunate, though, is that, like, vaping taxes don't work. Um, I you think you've seen my latest recent research, research and commentary mm -hmm. last week that I published because I was actually talking to Amy Lane, Indiana Smoke Free Alliance, fantastic. Um, and we were, I was like, you know, they're looking at these taxes that this is going to deter youth. And I was like, you know, we need to look at the numbers. Do they actually work? And I was like, wait, Pennsylvania, they enacted a 40% wholesale tax in 2016. Where are the, where are the numbers? And, and thank God it wasn't that hard. I didn't have to do that much research because Pennsylvania does their own surveys on, you know, youth health and whatever. Mm -hmm. And uh, the PAYS survey, Pennsylvania Annual Youth Survey. And yeah, sure, sure enough, they had one for 2015, 2017. They're conducting one late this year. It'll be published early next year. And I bet you that it still increased. Um, but yeah, youth vaping increased. Now, it did de I, I did decrease among sixth and eighth graders. Um, but I think that you would probably see that in a lot of states. I don't think the tax, you know, deterred that one. But Youth vaping taxes, I think, are you know taxing these products to keep them out of kids, just shows goes to show you that lawmakers don't understand that kids 
rely on social sources to get their tax to you get these products they're already paying a fig pretty much i was what i call it you know i remember when i was 17 getting my older cooler friends to go pick me up a carton of cigarettes and i had to give them a pack of cigarettes i mean mm -hmm. for their time and you know and doing something illegal but not that they cared about the illegality of it but um so i mean it just punishes you know, smokers who are trying to quit. And I, and I really have problems in states like Indiana that where you spend 1.3% of the tobacco monies you get on helping people quit. And now you're gonna turn around and tax them. Um, and, I, and I really don't think the states are doing it to deter youth. Um, I think they're doing it for revenue. That I don't doubt for a minute because it, it's not, it's not a, a deterrent. It is to add to the general fund or to do something else. Here in Ohio, they had they haven't introduced any kind of tax, but for Ohio, it's a T twenty one that yeah. is going on. So yeah. I turned around and I I did a little bit of thinking about it, and I I spoke with James Jarvis, mm -hmm. and what I came up with were three things basically. Number one, they're trying to strip the rights away from people that are of legal age. They're trying to take away their right of choice. If somebody's smoking and they're nineteen years old and they want to go to a vapor product, which is safer. They can't. I said, that's strike one. And I was trying to aim for the people that are neither smokers nor vapors. So I said, the second thing is now you're going to compound this issue of youth vaping because now you're going to have three more years of youth that are being thrown into this. So now you're going to have numbers that are not true. But the biggest one, they're projecting in the first year that this goes into effect, a $17 million shortfall for the budget because of oh, the yeah. loss of taxation from tobacco. And yeah. the second year, it's $27 million, is what I read. So I told people, I said, look, you have to understand, you're losing $17 million from tax revenue, okay? But then there's this thing called the Master Settlement Agreement. In 2018, Ohio alone received $331 million in change from the MSA. So now you're losing tax revenue, and you are going to be losing MSA money. So now we're looking somewhere between 20 and possibly $30 million. Yep. Ohio is not going to go, well, that's okay. We'll, we'll eat it. We'll be okay. No. They're going to raise taxes somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And yep. this, is, this is what the general public does not know. They're yeah. like, yes, T21, keep it out of the hands of kids. <laughs> you dumbasses, what's wrong with you? Now, I'm baffled by that, and I get stirred up by that. I can't even imagine what it looks like on your end, because you oh. have got to be dealing with some... You sent me a couple of quotes, and I never used their names, but they were hilarious from the people that were just absolutely giving stupid remarks Oh yeah. on the floor. <laughs> Yeah, no, the T21 is a big one. I mean, it's a whole freedom, you know, freedom um, issue. Um, I also don't think that it, I mean, I get where, you know, you, right now you have, you know, 18-year-olds that are seniors in high school that can legally buy these products and, you know, and they're enterprising enough. They can make a whole business selling it to minors and everything, um, you know, and just go to school. But I don't, like... <sighs> I don't get why it's happening now and it wasn't happening in the 90s when youth smoking was at its all-time height. You didn't do Tobacco 21, you didn't restrict flavors, you know, you weren't only throwing you know, cigarettes in age-restricted stores or whatnot. Um, it's just a response to this youth vaping and honestly, the, the numbers are all wonky too that public health has given people out. So, I mean, I just, I have a major issue with it, it though I will sit here and say it and we, uh, we at Heartland have an issue with it too because it's like, we obviously will never support a T21 proposal ever, but it's really hard to sit here and go against what the big tobacco is. I was talking to Kevin Price and I was like, you know, if you're in a committee hearing and you got Altria, Reynolds, Jewel, oh yeah, T21, this will help our kids. And you got a vape shop owner that's like, oh, well, screw you. Perception wise, it just makes you look like you don't care about the kids, but big tobacco does. And it, that's a sad fact. It's so bad. Yeah, I mean, it's just, uh, and it's nerve wracking as well. Um, because, and honestly, I think big tobacco and, you know, Jewel or whatnot, I think the only reason they did T21 was to throw a bone. And once again, I don't get why this industry is acquiescing and to like, you know, throwing things on this negotiation table 
when the other side has not negotiated anything at all. They have not given you anything. Oh, they gave, they extended the PMTA deadline, you know, to like ask for approval of your product or whatnot, but then, oh, they took it back, you know, so. Yep. And, and that's it. <laughs> it. It's a lot of that, but it is going on that a lot of people, when you say, you know, you don't understand why, why are we bartering when there's absolutely no reason to be bartering? Yes. They're not going to give no. us anything. They they yeah. want to kill vapor product, period. It's costing them money. It's costing big tobacco money. It's costing big pharma money. That's it. And the states in taxation. You know, New York. Oh, yeah. New York alone. My understanding is there's a possibility that they'll drop the flavor language out of New York, but they want to keep the 20% wholesale tax. Yeah. And they want to keep that tax in place because they're losing revenue because people are vaping and not smoking. Plus the Indian reservation, they're not making any money off of those sales of cigarettes. People yeah. think that I'm crazy or they think that other people that talk about this are crazy. But if I'm not mistaken, you're able to see this on the front line in the courtrooms all the time. Yeah. Well, and I mean, even when you go, I mean, as you saw on that document and, and you feel free to share it with people too. I mean, it does have a lot of information on some of these, like some of the laws and legislation that I've seen, but you got to read through these bills because it's like, okay, um, Oregon's the best classic example right now. Oregon, Kate Brown wants a $2 pack um, cigarette tax increase to pay for Medicaid. And yet lawmakers have put out what I like at 95% or I forget that the, they're all mixing in my head right now because they're all doing different percentages across the state. But they want to do it, you know, a, um, Cigarette or an e-cigarette e tax, and it's all dedicated to the general fund. So I'm like, I have an op-ed that's like in the editing process right now because I'm like, this is bullshit. You know, you want to pay for Medicaid yet, or you're not listening to any of the science of like, oh wait, you could probably save a lot of more money on Medicaid if you had all of your smokers switch like to e-cigarettes. Mm -hmm. and, and that's they why they want to they want to get rid of them in the yeah. worst way. You you mentioned that they want to add a tax to pay for Medicaid or Medicare. Where is that at? <laughs> That's Oregon. Oregon's got the three. They've got Kate Brown and which in 2018, late uh, 2018, had been touting doing a cigarette tax increase. Um, and yeah, they got, what the, you know, the le legislators put out the bill on that one's $2 pack increase on cigarettes. And they're actually, from what I was reading on some of it, I mean, they're, they're, they stand to lose a lot of money on that one because they get a lot of people from Washington coming in and buying cigarettes. So um, it's like, once again, as you mentioned, like with what's going to happen in Ohio with the T21 thing, yeah, you're going to lose revenue on doing this. Um, and it's honestly, and I get what this whole, like, let's offset healthcare costs, but none of that is like going to happen in the short term and that would be like long term you know people that smoke cigarettes at the age of 18 don't have the you know health and you know problems until you know 20 years later down the road right so it's kind of just asinine honestly but they you're gonna see that i know last year when i was looking at legislation that i think it was illinois that they were looking at T21 and they were also looking at a vaping tax to offset the re revenue that they would lose. Cause I think they would lose like 43 million in the first year or something was really? what the fiscal office had found out. So um, it's just, it's alarmism. I mean, completely. I, 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 and it's unfortunate that like at the end of the day, the people getting lost in this one is the smokers. How so? I'm curious. How how do you how do you phrase that one when you well, say? Well, because okay, so I'm doing numbers. Okay, smokers are down. I want to say it's like 34 million now. You have 34.3 million mm -hmm. American smokers, um, and that's awesome. I know when I wrote a policy booklet a couple of years ago, it was 38 million. So you've got you know I'm just gonna get about what, what like five million less or something. Um, and you've got about 3 million vapors um, that have used e-cigarettes to quit smoking successfully. Um, and about 6 million that are dual using smoking cigarettes and they're me, the, the, you know, the, who the FDA and public health people hate. Um, but when you, I mean, they're already, you, you don't have enough. You still have 34 million people smoking and you only have 3 million who, you know, you got like 10 million vapors. Um, you, and you, so about what, like 9 million of them are smokers or former smokers. So you really haven't captured that much of the smoking population as it is. 
And that's without the crazy regulations. That's without the crazy taxation. That's without the labor ban. So everything that's going on now, I mean, I don't agree with classifying as a tobacco product. I don't agree with um, not vaping in places that you can't smoke. Or, you know, I, I think that's wrong. Um, I, I'll say it here. I vape on an airplane. I know I read some story about some guy who got caught, but like, I'm not that dumb and, and to do that. I'm one of those sleuth vapors that I'll, I'll blow it into my clothes or whatnot. If I'm in a restaurant or something like the little kids do and then schools and it pisses me off. I can't yell at them because I do it. Um, yep. but you know, you, there's so much stigma around it still that you're not capturing the smokers out there and all these, and I, and all these, you know, banning pod systems from um convenience stores that's where people go and get their cigarettes from you know and how do you like not allow a tobacco harm reduction product in a place that you're selling combustible cigarettes at like how, i mean and, the, and they will never get rid of cigarettes out of c stores i mean that will c stores will go on a riot if that happens it oh yeah they like would 30 of their revenue but that's all that it's doing is you're just you're really hurting the smokers and you're hurting the people who have quit smoking using these products. And I, those are things that anybody that is doing any kind of advocacy knows, but I wanted people that are watching or going to listen on the podcast or something. I want people to hear someone besides me or someone different to hear what is going on. It's important. The smokers are getting railroaded because they're trying to outlaw a 95 at least 95 percent safer product or they yeah. want to ban the flavors or they want to tax the shit out of it and get rid of it, it it's just okay I'm and yes to... guys i am drinking on this sorry technically i'm like off of work but i'm still doing work all uh -huh. right what i'm going to do is bring up your excel spreadsheet because i here again this thing that needs to be updated. I, I will get to it after I have time to like not be writing on the bills. Um, this is an Excel. You saw the Word document, and I closed that out to save a little bit of room on my PC. This is an Excel spreadsheet that Lindsay keeps of all the states and all of the bills that are in the states. And you can see there's T21, tobacco tax, taxes. Um, oh lord. And this is in Connecticut. Flavor bans, licensing, Bunch vapor. Oh, here's here's one I'm going to ask you about. I'm going to highlight this right here for people. What the flying fuck is a V21 for people that oh, don't yeah. know? V21, that's where you can still buy cigarettes and everything, but you can't buy vaping products. And it's Connecticut, Iowa, Nebraska. I think Kentucky was looking at it when it when some of the amendments had changed it to that as well, but that didn't go anywhere. But yep. Um, I know Jerry Reed had said uh, Jewel steamrolled them with T twenty one in his yeah. state. If I'm not mistaken, Maryland turn around and they they want to create a clause that it's T twenty one for the public, but if you're in the military. It's still 18. Virginia did that too. And California did it as well. Um, when they, California is the second state, they had exempted uh, military people. Okay, let me, before I say anything that's on my mind, let me ask you what your thought of that is. Well, I mean, like, that's kind of bullshit. You're putting more, you know, emphasis on the store owner to distinguish, like, you know, whether someone's in the military, someone's not. And, you know, if I was an enterprise, you know, enterprising young person under the age of 21, I'd make military, fake military IDs. And, you know, the, like the penalty on that one, if you get caught, that's not like a fake state ID. That's a federal issued ID. So yep. um, I think it's, I mean, I get their logic on it, um, but I think it's just, I don't agree with it. And I know like Washington's, um, T21 didn't have any. So if you're under 18, they actually had a um, penalty if you got caught with a you know, cigarette product or tobacco product. I think it was like, I mean, it wasn't that much. It's like 50 bucks or something. That is um, 18 to 20 year olds are exempt from that penalty. Here's my thinking that goes behind that. And you can check me if you would. But doesn't that actually create a second class citizen? Yeah. 
you're exempting people from certain things. I mean, the Constitution was was written all men are created equal. Not all men are created equal except, you know. Granted, at the time, it read that way, but, you know, nonetheless, yeah, um, it does. I I, I mean, there's also no enforcement on this. Um, I don't know exactly what public, I mean, health is actually trying to do. I don't know how, like, what... Are cops going to have to go do stings, you know, on like 18 and 20 year olds trying to buy a a, a cigarette or an e-cigarette? I mean, and and don't we, shouldn't we be expensing or, you know, exhausting our law enforcement elsewhere? That isn't, and and here again, I spoke with a former police chief and we spoke about enforcement capability. And he said that actually falls to the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms. Yeah. Not the FDA. Yep. The FDA can go along and check on things, but they have no enforcement capability by yep. law. Yep, that's true. And what he told me was, BATF, and now explosives, but I call it BATF because that's what I know it as. Yeah. But the BATF does not have the manpower to actually go around and police things the way that they should. Oh, yeah. Yeah, especially if you mean the, the opioid epidemic. We all knew my hang up on that one, guys. Um, but I mean, they, they don't have time to deal with this. They they they're dealing with fentanyl from China and Mexico. Um, I mean, and explosives. I mean, yeah. Minnesota. Hey, everybody. I mean, so it's yeah. Um, and they they. I mean, they don't. And that's another reason why. I mean, it is the Tibet. It is the. From what I understand, it's campaign for tobacco free kids. The Truth Initiative. That are the ones that are pushing getting way of punitive punishments um, on minors and possession of tobacco products, which I'm going to call bullshit on that one. Yes. Schools have a zero to- tolerance policy when it comes to alcohol, marijuana. You're looking at a pretty crazy drug charge, especially on school grounds. I, th- th- You're not giving me like these are these dumb kids that are, want to be cool. They want to jewel or, and, you know, do it in class so they can go tell their friend. Yo, and that my, and Mrs. Miller's science class, I just totally did a huge cloud and nobody noticed. Whatever, they're kids. It's a new technology. But you're punishing adult smokers by enforcing taxation, these regulations, you know, when you're if you get them out of convenience stores, these small towns that don't have a vape shop, these smokers will have nothing, you know, to be able to go get these products. Um, I mean, it's I, I'm up for a five hundred dollar penalty if you get caught with a jewel, whatever, five hundred bucks. I don't care. Or you know, five hundred hours of community service. As long as they make it across the board for every offending item. Yep. Yes. See, All across the board. I mean, and somebody said in the comments and they're all right, you know, I mean I know from what I know in my studying and stuff, like in twenty sixteen kids were vaping. But you didn't have like the the smaller you know devices that are easily they can hide and everything, but they weren't vaping nicotine either. They were like overwhelmingly. I think it was the monitoring the future survey that found like almost like eighty percent of them had vaped just flavoring or no, seventy six percent I think or whatnot. But it, and then you see it changed you know this past year with what came out you know the the uh, monitoring the future in the national tobacco survey. Um, and even the Pennsylvania data that I looked at, like they noted that too, that like there was an increase in nicotine consumption. So um, I'm not going to blast on Juul specifically, but there was a shift in what, what kids were vaping um, over the past couple of years. Yeah, it's hard for them to go walking into school. Kid, and and yeah, somebody, else, somebody else made the point, and it, it's, it's so true. No kid is going to turn around and drop a hundred bucks or more for a mod and yeah. an RDA and then flavor and possibly yeah, lose it. You, you, you can't <laughs> hide this in your damn coat, you know? No, yeah. I Now, I, I have two things. First, for the people that are listening or watching, I am not against the military in any way, shape, or form. I, my family has been in the military for generations. Uh, when they create a law that splits a person that is in the military and is 18 and not in the military and is 18, those two people are equal and should be treated as such. I, I, can't, I can't condone a law that says this one is better than that one. Yeah. I have a hard time with that. Well, uh, military didn't even get exemptions from 
alcohol 21. I mean, and that's another, I mean, that's a, a good point to make on this one, too, is the fact that, like, if it's so bad for you, what are the lungs of military people so different? I mean, it's, but you would think that's the way they, you know, they treat e-cigarettes if you look at the way other countries treat them. Yeah. I want to go and take a look here at your Excel sheet. I don't know if you have it handy in front of you or not, um, or if you're able to check things out. What is the most offending? Now, I think somebody in, said it's either Massachusetts or Maryland is trying to do a complete flavor ban right now. Yeah, Massachusetts, I think, is that what I saw again. That's in, I don't have that. That's a newer development. I can't fathom how they do that. But in, in your Excel sheet, what is the most offending state that you can think of? Um, well, California, Connecticut, New York, Hawaii. I mean, Hawaii had that one that, like, thankfully it went nowhere, but you know that you were going to have to be 100 years old to buy tobacco products. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's lofty, but, um, Connecticut's got some weird ones. And once again, like I said, you got to read through these bills because I know Connecticut's got like a flavor ban and it doesn't like all the other flavor bans that you see will sit here and say characterizing flavor besides menthol or tobacco um because they're flavors a lot of people don't get that like tobacco is a flavor it's one of the 600 ingredients in cigarettes actually they, they yeah. add that to it because it would taste like shit without it um <laughs> even it actually does taste like it so i'm and i i don't even know connecticut because i still have to figure this out on their flavor bad because they don't have that in the language it just reads all characterizing flavors you know are banned and so part of me wants to call up the sponsor and be like, do you know that tobacco is a flavor? No, nah, I bet you didn't know that, huh? Okay. I mean, so, um, I mean, they all are hastily written legislation um, to respond to things. And it looks like they got no input from vapors at all. Um, I, I have, I've been making other ones going through FDA compliance checks, actually, um, and sending them out to lawmakers and being like, hey, by the way, the vape shops aren't in violation. Here's a list of all the, you know, all the things in your state that have addresses. Maybe some of them are in your district. You can go find out how they're preventing youth, ag you know, sales of tobacco products to youth. They don't like that. They don't, I mean, I'm, I'm, lawmakers don't really like me anymore because I kind of just give them numbers now. And because you bring them pieces of truth and you say, did you do this? Yeah. What about this? Now, how about this over here? They don't want to yeah. hear that. They, they want their legislation to pass with their name on it. So yeah. that they, they look like they've done something. It's one thing that I do know. Next week, and I, I got to stop just for a second. Next week, I have um, Representative Osborne from New Hampshire. And nice. I know that. He didn't respond yeah. to my phone call. So I'm a little, now I'm a little bit jealous that you got that before me. <laughs> it, it, it was, of all things, it was a post that Lindsay had put up of Osborne, Representative Osborne, speaking. And behind him, it looked like people were just apathetic as hell, you know, not listening, doing things. And I said, you know, great comment or a great sentence that he had, but it looks like the people behind him really couldn't care. He came back and replied and said, those are actual staff people that are doing the work that they're supposed to be doing. And I went, well, shit, now I feel like a heel, you know. <laughs> so yeah. I got in touch with him. I said, would you be willing to come on the show and educate, if, if nobody else, educate me, how can I better approach a political body so, A, I don't look like a moron, B, I don't stumble over myself or my private parts, and C, that I can actually say what needs to be said. He goes, absolutely. I went, whoa, this is going to be nice. Yeah. You know, but he's one of the so few lawmakers that are on our side. You yeah, know, Tennessee, Tennessee is a whole different area. And there are other states that have some amazing characters that are in their Senate, you know, whatever. I, I don't know of them offhand, but it strikes me that most of the lawmakers are out there, even as you said, are uneducated. They have no clue what the hell they're really talking about. You know, uh, somebody said in New York, when they went to the New York hearing, they, they took a 120 mil bottle and said, this is what you are going to say is a ticket offense by having this on my person. Yeah. And they were like, well, I thought 120 mils is like a gallon. It's, 
they don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm like, really? Uh, yeah. Well, none of them spoke anymore. I mean, and so, and it is, and it is really unfortunate. And it's, you know, like it's people like Representative, you know, um, Osborne in New Hampshire that really that we need to be focusing on because they're the ones, the lawmakers are the ones who can go and go educate their buddies and everything on these issues and on the whole issue of, you know, tobacco harm reduction in general. Um, but they don't even know, I mean, like with their money is their tobacco money is what they're doing with that. I know when I was in Indiana, it was so great when we're sitting there, American Cancer Society comes up and of course they get to go first. Everyone who's always in favor of these get to go first. And so they bring up, um, Indiana spent, um, I don't know, the numbers might be foggy, but, um, 7.6 million, I want to say $7.5 million on tobacco prevention and like education in uh, 2018. And that's all the American Cancer Society sits there and says. So I get up because I already had that in my testimony because Amy's like, oh, they took your quote. And I was like, well, let's see what they say. Oh, well, I was like, I was like, American Cancer Society is correct. You know, you spent $7.6 million out of $538 million that you received in tobacco settlement payments and taxes. I mean, our 1.3% is what you and They've amended the bill that it's now going to go towards public health instead of the general fund. But um, when you start nitpicking them and breaking it down for them, I do think they listen and I do think they pay attention. It just needs to be presented in a good way and it needs to be emphasized completely. Um, James Jarvis has done a great job. I know he's told me about, you know, grabbing a state reps and having them come to the fact, you know, going to an e-liquid company and seeing how it is. They're yep. assuming that we're all making these, you know, e-liquids in our bathtubs now. The regulations they put out may force us to have to do that, but um, right now it is, it's a very regulated industry that the industry regulated itself even before the FDA came in or the states came in. So, um, and I don't think they really realize that at all. Like, they just think now, that it's all tobacco. Here's here is a caveat to what you're saying. The people that were paying attention and doing it the right way regulated themselves. And then yes. the assholes in the vaping arena with their horseshit labels and their crappy marketing and their garbage created the narrative that most of these politicians are picking up and going, yeah, but look at this. <laughs> and that irritates, I know that irritates everybody that's trying to do it the right way. Well, they're you know? mix matching too. I mean, like they're like, oh, flavors, and oh, Jewel. Jewel has shitty flavors. Okay, I only like it because I like their cucumber flavor because it's not sweet. All right, you know, I mean, so, and then they're like, oh, they're getting kids. Jewel's got n decent packaging. It's not, you know, a kid label at all. But you're right. Then you have the people who do have the kid labels and everything, but they all have the mods too that kids aren't using so it's it's kind of actually entertaining to watch some of this legislation that they put up because it's like you haven't a clue at all i mean it's so and they don't get nicotine content i will sit here and say that they don't when you try to explain them the nick salt versus the e-liquid and just you know regular nicotine liquid they don't get this at all and where you're like you know kids aren't jeweling to like taste flavors kids are drooling because it, it's a high nick content it's like you know i know i like head it. buzz well yeah and it's good for it it's good for current smokers i think jewel when jewel first came out it was a revolutionary thing i mean it gets the throat hit or right, all this you know, whatever that the smokers need or whatnot um i think it's a good transitioning product you know, after people get more used to getting flavors, you know, uh, and, and that they can go into different products and learn more about it or whatnot. Um, and it's just unfortunate that kids got their, their hands on it. And, and that's something. We're going to take a break here for just a, a couple of minutes because we need to take a sponsor break. And without our sponsors, Smoke Free Radio could not do what it does. So give us a couple minutes. We'll be right back. Hey now, this is Dimitri with Smoke Free Radio reminding you to please show some love to our wonderful sponsors. Without them, there would be no Smoke Free Radio, and they are as follows. All the way from Florida, Moon Mountain Vapor with locations in Florida, 
and their liquid available for wholesale and retail, moonmountainvapor.com. Some of the best custards and tobaccos on the market from the Brickwells Vaping Company. The lovely shell with a vapor bar. Locations in Texas, Virginia, and West Virginia. And of course, online at thevaporbar.com. And who says you can't have award-winning e-liquid without cartoon characters? That's exactly what you're going to get at theplumeroom.com. And finally, of course, the Vaping Advocate magazine that has generously provided the telephone lines for you to communicate with us. Thank you for your support. And finally, for you, the listener, don't forget to check out the coupons and codes page on Smoke Free Radio. Pick up some e-liquid and save some money. From all of us here at Smoke Free Radio, thank you for your continued support. Folks, P. Bassardo here, and you're listening to Vaping and the Mic with Mike Peterson. Coming back from our break, this evening I've got Lindsay Stroud from the Heartland Institute. Uh, before I get back to you, Lindsay, believe it or not, I'm going to stop over here and check and see. Uh, it looks like somebody's trying to call in, so I'm going to check and see if I can actually pick this up. And we'll go like this, area code 250, you're on the air and vaping in the mic. Hi, Mike. Hi, Lindsay. It's Bill Tarling here. How you doing, sir? Uh, doing well. I, do, I just want to uh, remind people, too, that um, all this stuff about the youth epidemic, uh, thanks to Jewel and so on, people got to remember, it's the FDA and Campaign for Killing Kids that actually promoted the Jewel because prior to that, the studies were done, and when there was originally a worry about kids vaping, because some kids had started, they had found that over 80% used zero nick. And it wasn't exactly because they were using the big devices. You couldn't use it stealth. And so it was kept very limited. And that's when the FDA and uh, Campaign for Killing Kids jumped in, promoted the jewel. It took off. And suddenly, they're the ones who created this fake epidemic. You, you know, and I, I have to tell you that I'm very much in favor of listening to what you're saying, because uh, former gentleman uh, Mark Anton had said, previous to Juul, we never had a youth epidemic or a flavor epidemic. You didn't hear of it until Juul came. And, and yeah, like I said... They actually did the studies because they were worried, oh, kids are going to get all these nicotine and all the, they're getting all these big devices and look at these giant clouds. So they were worried. Then they did the study and they found out that, yeah, over 80% were zero nick. And because the pods were so expensive, it wasn't exactly something that every kid could afford. And so it was kept very minimal. <laughs> and, and those are the things that a lot of, you're right, a lot of people just either don't know, they don't pay attention to. It's not something that is brought up in public, because God forbid that we should tell people what the truth about Jewel is. Yeah, uh, Mike, it's really distorted on the phone here, because uh, the volume levels are overloaded. So I'm, I'm going to jump back to listen to the show, but I just wanted to uh, drop in the comment. <laughs> well, I appreciate you giving a call, Bill. Thank you. Thanks, both you and Lizzie. Bye now. Bye. Bill Tarling from all the way out in Vancouver, on Vancouver Island in Canada. And he's on the, the other side. He takes, he, he watches, there's a page called Vape Distortion on Facebook. That If you get a chance, go take a look at it because he tracks a lot of information worldwide. So you have a, an idea of what's happening on a worldwide topic. But he's right. Um, before, and I love the way that he said it, campaign to kill kids. <laughs> it just cracks me up. Before that happened, did you see 
any kind of problem, epidemic or otherwise, before Jewel came along? No. I mean, and I don't even see an epidemic now, I, quite honestly, when you break down the numbers. Um, like I said, you know, you were like 2016 monitoring the future survey. Kids were overwhelmingly vaping zero Nick, vaping because of flavors. Um, it wasn't, and even now, I mean, the numbers aren't even, at least I know from like Pennsylvania, it was still, it went down from like 76, but it was still like 64% of we're vaping, at least in 2017, we're vaping um, only flavors. So it's not like, you know, all these kids are, you know, are addicted to e-cigarettes like they're making it seem. Um, I don't, I mean, one thing with the numbers, and I, kind of, I try to stress this to lawmakers that I'm like, you know, the, the way that they answer, the way that past, the way that current e-cigarette use is defined is any use in the past 30 days. It could be every single day. It could be two times. So they don't, they, they don't differentiate between these kids that are dueling at a party or that, you know, are the kid who's like sitting there in the bathroom on, you know, between the bells, you know, going hardcore and, you know, sucking down their jewel. Huh. Uh, and so, and, and, and I'll just bring it up. I mean, you didn't, uh, uh, has any vape store been robbed, you know, for kids to go get their nicotine? I mean, no. You have had epidemics going on in this country where you did have that happen, though. So I don't, you know, people robbing places to get it. I just don't. I, I, it's it's. It's just one more thing with alarmism. When e-cigarettes first came out, it's this whole idea, oh, they don't help. Uh, what was the first? Oh, they're not safer for you. They're, they're not any safer for you than combustible cigarettes. Well, science disproved that. Oh, they don't help you quit. Oh, well, vapors disproved that. What's the, This is the last argument they have now. Oh, the kids. Let's take some numbers. I mean, and you know the FDA is reaching. I mean, two weeks ago at the seizure, 35 seizures out of 10 million vapors. Wow, that we need to do something about that. That we, That's a travesty. We can't have that happen in this country. I'm going to say, because she brought it up, in the FDA's press release, the, the number she's saying is what they said, 35 reported cases from 2010 to 2019. And a few paragraphs further down in that paper, they said, well, we can't really attribute this to vaping and we can't really say for sure that it was a cause and later they came out and they put in a little bit more information and say some of these people had prior incidents of seizure some had done any other kind of drug and it was in a combination of but they didn't tell anybody that the same amount of issues had been found with nrt products nasal spray patches and gum so why is it that they're focusing on vaping when they don't focus on their approved bullshit well the the what what's what, uh, what what's the what's the prescription drug why can't i think of it right now um Clint, what is it uh shantix oh shantix has a black box warning on it the same warning that's on oxycontin uh, you know, the strongest warning that the FDA can have out on a prescription drug. Um, and like, yeah, there are reports. It was funny because I went through, I do a lot of research. If you can't tell, I do a lot of digging. Um, and so it's going through like news reports in like 2011. And the, the, the headlines then were like even more alarming because they had specific cases. So, you know, I mean, like, I, I think we've all seen the one where the, the North Carolina parents put their kid through rehab because of his dueling addiction or something. That's one story. You heard multiple stories on Shantex that, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, and, and how actually, I mean, I think side effects was the sleepwalking incident with side effects or whatnot. Um, that movie, like, I think that kind of came from Shantex. And Shantex had all those crazy people, with, you know, some sleepwalking, doing crazy things. You, that spun off into TV shows. Um, it's so, and the fact that they were still pushing that, um, even though it's not, proven to work. I mean, e-cigarettes are twice as effective as nicotine replacement therapy and getting people to quit smoking and stay quitting smoking. Um, and what a lot of people don't realize too is that especially with yeah, the pod systems, you don't get to do this, um, but you know, uh, people are decreasing their nicotine levels. So if nicotine is such an addictive drug that you're, you know, lifelong, it makes no sense, you know, that I had a woman reach out to me, 65 years old, smoked for 40 years, 
um, started vaping. She brought her nicotine level down. Like, I think she started out like at a nine or something. She brought it down to like three. All right. So, I mean, and I know people who brought it down to zero and they're still vaping because they like, uh, you know, they just like it. Mm -hmm. They like that, you know, the action in itself. Smoking is, it's not, you know, you just don't take something and, you know, it's an act to it. Um, you know, Oh, packing your cigarettes. I know vapors that still, you know, pack their, like they're packing a pack of cigarettes. So there's a, that's one thing I haven't done. I didn't take my bottle of juice and go, okay, let's knock this down. <laughs> well, I know them that pack, the, 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 I know that they're like, hit it like they're packing a pack of cigarettes. Um, and I, and a lot of people don't realize too, I mean, I haven't completely quit smoking yet. I am working on it all, you guys. Okay. I'm like down to like five cigarettes a day or something. Good so, for you. you know, but um, I uh, like, I mean, well, and people miss cigarettes. I don't know any vapor that wouldn't sit here and say who was offered a cigarette that wouldn't take it. it it's hard. It, it is definitely, there are times that it is hard as hell not to do it. it, oh, it 20, session 2019, everybody should have lit up, okay? I mean, it's just been insane, so. What's one of the worst or a couple of the worst things that you have heard said on the floor, so to speak, that you can relate in public. Popcorn lung. Uh, that's it. I didn't. I didn't hear it. I saw it. The one that that lady, I think it was Michigan, that was like popcorn lung. They went to the hospital. I'm like, popcorn lung. It's it, you can't find out if somebody had popcorn lung until they're dead. All right. So that's just bad, wonky things right there. But also like, so 2016. Um, the best one I thought I heard was um, out in North Dakota. Um, that, oh, this is just tobacco companies trying to get out of a tax. Um, and like, and I have to, t- and I, and I, and I wish that I could get some representative from the tobacco industry that would actually go on the record of saying this. But when I met with some representative with British American Tobacco last year, I asked them, I was like, you know, y'all think, you, you know, e cigarettes got introduced in the U.S. market in 2007. It wasn't until 2012 that Lorillard acquired Blue. You had a major tobacco company that actually had an e-cigarette product on the market. At that point, it was all e-cigarette companies. Mm -hmm. Um, And then in 2014, Reynolds put out Views, and um, Altria did their Mark 10. So, I mean, this was, they waited, and they, yeah, and they waited till the lawsuit went through and everything um, with Sadara. But I've always looked at it, like, I asked them, and they admitted to me, I was like, you guys kind of looked at, you know, vaping as kind of a gimmick. You know, and then, oh, you saw how big sales were, and you're like, oh, shit, we lost most of it. We're going to lose our customers unless we get onto this. And I think it is responsible for the tobacco companies to acquire those brands that they can, you know, acquire. Because there are the ones who got people addicted to smoking cigarettes. They should be having safer alternative products out there. That's my, and vapors don't kill me on that one or anything, but I like them moving towards doing these products. As long as they do it fairly and they give credit where credit's due. But also, they have crappy products. You're never going to have the 7,000 flavors that are available on the market today because of big tobacco. Um, but there, I mean, I imagine in the next couple of years, you're going to see them acquire some of them that are already registered. I mean, anyone who's got an e-cigarette company right now in a, fl- in a flavor line that's registered, it's been registered, you really have a good opportunity right now on, you know, and just try to maintain it as long as you can. I mean. Yeah, they'll buy the ones that are actually make it through all the way up until the PMTA date. For people that you qualified something and you said, don't hate me. And I, I want people to remember something about Lindsay and working at the Heartland Institute. Lindsay is working from a tobacco harm reduction standpoint. This is the same thing I went through with Kevin Crowley. I, I butted heads with Kevin until I understood where he was coming from. Lindsay is for all things that are tobacco harm reduction okay yeah. that includes the snus the iqos you know things like that that are reducing harm she's not just a vapor advocate it's part of who she is and what she does so when you take a look at some of the things that she does keep that in mind because she's doing a hell of a lot more 
than most of the people that I can think of. And that was one of the reasons that I put this background behind me this evening was a bunch of empty chairs because that's kind of representative of all of the people that aren't doing a damn thing in the vapor industry right now. Uh, James Jarvis put up how many calls in Ohio for T21. There was 138 that were registered males going out. And he showed where they're coming from, okay, per county. And some of it has nothing. Now, I know damn well some of those counties have shops in them. What the hell is wrong with you shop owners that are not telling your customers, fill this out. I, come on, folks. You go to CASA and you take three minutes to fill out this little form on CASA and hit submit. That's it. I'm done ranting for a moment. <laughs> hey, I'm okay with that rant. One of, well, one of the reasons why I love the vapors and the vaping industry, I mean, I, I studied government. I've worked for state legislators. And the apathy from the American public, especially from the millennials, oh, my God. So when I got, you know, the heartland threw me on because I was a cigarette smoker. Oh, you can handle vaping. And I was like, all right. And I was like, oh, my God. These people have dealt with so much from the state, and led, you know, local, state, and federal governments. Um, and with a lot of, like, clue. And I, I shouldn't call them stupid, but honestly, I mean, they're very clueless lawmakers um, responding to really bad alarmism, unfor especially 2019. And it's really unfortunate because – I don't think anybody in the industry expected it to be this bad. I know at the VTA conference, I know the people that where I was talking to in December, you know, T21 um, was, we knew that was going to be an issue. We didn't realize that all 50, you know, all well, what the 44 states were going to go throw up legislation on it. Um, I didn't realize that they were going to go like a bunch of states were going to start taxing it. Um, and then the regulations clean indoor air act and, you know, d defining it as a tobacco product. I, I mean, it, it, I don't think any of us expected it to really go that bad. But honestly, I, that's what the FDA wanted. FDA couldn't come in here and unilaterally mm. just like wipe out the industry. Let's go. Let's go do a Twitter campaign. Let's bring it. Put out a couple of press statements. Let's get the Surgeon General to call it an epidemic. State lawmakers will listen. It's no different than that. Gottlieb's little last gift to us was, oh, the seizure crap. Oh, that's awesome. Let's just have even more bad legislation come out. I mean, because they have to respond mm. to it because public health is calling it that. But public health England, the equivalent of the FDA over in the UK, promotes the use of e-cigarettes. Why? They pay for health care over there. And that's and something that's hugely... <laughs> that's something that's hugely different. Now, your Excel sheet is by state it, it's ranked by state but i've yeah. taken a moment because i want people to take a look at this before we run anywhere near out of time um i want people to take a look at this and i've re-ranked this by what they are not not a summary but or state but by what and she's talking about these taxes here are indoor clean indoor air acts e-liquid here are the flavor bands Okay, Connecticut, New Mexico, Hawaii, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, California, Connecticut, Washington. Then you've got indoor air bands. You've got labeling, more licensing. Okay, there's online sales that are trying to pass bills for stuff. Preemptions, regulations, T21s that are starting to sprout up all Everywhere. over the place a ton look at how many t21 pieces of legislation and how many different states and then you get to the tax okay and just real quick rhode island massachusetts mississippi illinois iowa vermont nebraska washington oregon kentucky new jersey new york this goes on and on and on and these are taxes that they want to pass folks t21 and tax and flavor bans are going to kill any business out there and if you think that i'm joking stop and take a look at what happened to pennsylvania lindsay mentioned it earlier they yeah. passed a 40 percent wholesale tax at the same time they also passed a 40 percent floor tax that they wanted you to pay 40 percent on whatever is in your store in tax and it decimated 
I, it, a lot of the vapor industry in Pennsylvania. It was just unreal. Yeah, the 120 and third of the shops. Well, actually, I had some shop owner call me up in a huff last week about my research and commentary, and I had to explain to her. I was like, no, 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 no. I'm not advocating any tax. You should probably do some research on the Heartland Institute. We're not for any tax at all on anything. But um, I was like, no, this is to do for lawmakers because I've heard it so many times. We got to tax these products so kids don't use them. Well, no, you don't. Um, I want to actually do uh, New Jersey passed with tax last year. That's another state that you can look at what, whether the effects of a tax had anything to do on youth vaping, uh, which I, I'm going to I can assure you it's not actually. Um, but it's I, I get lawmakers wanting to address this issue. It's just unfortunate that I mean, it's just been so overblown. Um, you, you, I don't want kids vaping. And honestly, I want to smack. If I saw a kid vaping, I'd probably smack them mm-hmm. and be like, you're ruining this for adult smokers. Um, I think though, for anyone who's listening and watching that uh, you need to go harass the crap out of your lawmaker. I mean, especially if you've got a tax going in there, go yell at them. You wanted me to quit smoking. If you keep preaching on that, nobody should smoke. I quit smoking. Now you want to tax me for quitting smoking. I mean, if you had a hundred constituents of some representative, you pretty much go to him and did like, okay, maybe I shouldn't do this. Um, I'm going through and looking at ATR tax pledges, um, signees, and seeing if they voted in favor of this tax. And um, won't, I don't think I'll be able to drop names in an op-ed, but I definitely will call them out. Um, I'm actually even going through their campaign you know, websites and seeing what they sat there and said about taxes. And if they voted yes on this tax, I'm going to call them out. Good uh, for you. I mean, <laughs> I were in a think tank. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But No, there's a lot of people that don't. It, apathy is the key word. There are so many people that are not taking the time to do anything because they yeah. expect other people to do it. Yeah. And nothing is going to get done. Even I was on a show uh, just a few days ago for the DIY side of vaping. And even the gentleman in that show had to say... Everybody that vapes has to get off their butt and make a phone call, drop an email, or show up in person. Yep. You know, now, I don't know if that is representative for a lot of the DIY industry. It, that's beside the point. But here is somebody on that side of the fence that recognizes and understands the importance of get up and do something because yes. apathy is going to kill us. Absolutely yeah. kill it. Yeah. No, and I. And- I, I like the when the lady, the sixty-five-year-old lady, had reached out to me. I was like, "This is what you need." I mean, they want to bring kids out to these hearings. Bring grandma. They actually vote, and they know that they vote. I mean, so I, I, and, um, I mean, if any vape shop owners are on this, get if you got somebody over the age of sixty-five coming into your shop, give them my information. I will help them like harass their lawmaker and make sure because they will listen to grandma. And and I, I know a lot of people. I mean, I I know it can be. I send out emails all the time to state lawmakers. Um, our research commentaries always get sent to them. I get a lot of those automated replies, you know, and it can make you feel like they don't listen. They're not reading it. Mm-hmm. As a former staffer, I can tell you that information is getting relayed to them. They might not read your whole individual message or whatnot, but they will have a list. If this many people, there will be their staffer will make a list to have a, this whatever bills in question. How many people called in favor of it? How many people called against it? And that will impact them. Um, and also put your address in there so they know that you're a constituent. Uh, that's the big one on there. They will respond to that one, um, you know, and, and harass your own lawmaker. Uh, I mean, I they're paid by your tax dollars. And if you knew some of the shit they try to get away with, you'd be even more willing to, like, go out there and, like, go harass them. I won't say that publicly, but uh, I might do it in a personal conversation. Yep. I'll give you details on some of the stuff I've seen. <laughs> I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Well, Lindsay, before we close up or wrap up, is there anything in particular that you would want to tell people that are either watching or listening on the podcast? Um, get involved with your state associations. Uh, that's the, always there. The movers and shakers right now. They have the, been the ones kind of stopping some of the bad legislation or at least making it like smaller. They also be the ones that can help you connect with lawmakers and such. Be in touch with your lawmakers. If you've quit smoking using this product, tell them. They need to know that. Right now, they're under the impression that this is big tobacco, trying to get little kids to start smoking. And 
and you, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to bring it up, the opioid crisis. The worries is reasons that they, this has never been, every time you read anything, they always bring up the pain patients. You can't restrict access because of all these millions of Americans that are in pain need this. You've got a million Americans, you got 34 million American smokers that need e-cigarettes so they can quit smoking. You're not seeing that in any of the stories at all right now. It's all restrict, 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 and the kids. You're not seeing anything about smokers. That's because y'all need to start telling them you've quit smoking with us. So, sorry, that's my little soapbox on that one. But they need to see more adults in there showing them how it saved their life. And that, that I think, is a perfect kind of thing because it is so true for so many people that have switched from cigarettes to vaping. We take it for granted. We pick up our vape and we go on with our day and we don't stop to think or we don't remember very quickly where we came from or why we're vaping now. We need to tell people about that. Well, folks, this is Lindsay Stroud. She is from the Heartland Institute. She covers a lot of wealth of information. She's on Facebook. Um, if you have questions, I know you can drop her a line on Facebook. Get in touch with her. Um, you also run... A podcast. Tell me about your podcast real quick. Voices of Vapors. Uh, I try. We don't swear on it. It's not a fun podcast. And I have to do it at work so I don't get to drink beers either. Um, but it's, I, it's once again, it's just trying to show the adult side. Um, and also, I, I love having business owners on there. I think that it's important for lawmakers to see the economic impact of this industry and their uh, local and state um, you know, communities. Um, but yeah, it's easy. I mean, if you have anybody you would be a good person on the show. I didn't get the indicted vaping congressman, Duncan Hunter, on there. I mean, and he was good, actually. I got to I got to figure out what flavor he was vaping. Blueberry crumb, actually. Um, and he's, yeah, he's got some stuff issued around him. But, hey, he vaped on the House floor. I got to, you know, stand up on that guy. But um, it's very easy. You just call in. I We record. It's edited, so it's polished. I know... Um, we pride ourselves. Heartland podcasts are heard a lot. Um, we uh, more than I think the Cato Institute actually, or at least downloaded. So um, yeah, I'm always looking for people to come on. I haven't done an episode in a while. I need to actually get on it. This is the second podcast I've been a guest on and been asked about my own podcast. So yeah. <laughs> so there's there's an open casting call. If you have a shop, if you are a manufacturer, if you are in the industry, Lindsay Stroud will put you on her podcast. She is looking for people, folks. Even if you're a vape shop owner, I mean, I, there's a lot of things we can talk about, you know, how much you do in sales, how many people do you employ, how are you, like, you know, making sure kids aren't getting these products, uh, what, you know, how are you complying with the laws, how are the health departments telling you about the laws, or, you know, did they just pass a T21 and nobody notified you, so I'm assuming probably has happened in a lot of places. Yeah, there's there's laws that... You you see the horror pictures where they're going to have a hearing about something and nobody shows up. Guess what happens? That law goes through really damn quick. And then five months later, when it's enacted as law, and people go, where the hell did that come from? Got to pay attention, folks. Well, Lindsay, I, honest to God, I appreciate you joining me this evening. Um, I always love it. Oh, we'll have to do it. Well, this I, is a mid-session update. We'll have to do it once sessions end. <laughs> I'll have a whole map of, of states, you know. When when does that happen? <laughs> Most states end in around May. Um, right now, you've got um, about forty four states in session. A couple are special sessions, but May is when you kind of start to see them taper off. You do have states that have full time uh, legislators. Wisconsin, yeah, I think, I think Ohio is a full time legislative body. California, Ohio, yep. So, um, hey, but the May is just, like, May is when I'm going on vacation. So. Well, then we will definitely have to get back together and have another show in May so we can yeah. see what the hell happened and wrap up for people. I will update that spreadsheet and it'll be like, victory, not victory. <laughs> yeah, pass, fail. And we're hoping to see a lot more of their bills fail yeah. than pass, oh, yeah. without a doubt. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this is Lindsay Stroud. She's with the Heartland Institute. Get in touch with her if you have questions. Um you can find her on Facebook. You can find her at, what is it, the heartlandinstitute.org? No, it's just heartland.org. Okay. And if you want to shoot me an email, it's lstroud, L-S-T-R-O-U-D, at heartland.org. 
So. There you go. A direct way to get in touch with her. Lindsay, I honestly appreciate you being on the show this evening. It's always informational, educational, no matter what. I try. <laughs> oh, you do an awesome job. For everybody else that's out there, either watching or listening on a podcast, next week I have the representative from New Hampshire, Mr. Osborne, and we're going to have a blast about that one. But until then, I hope everybody has a fantastic week, a great weekend. And I'll see you next time on Vaping in the Mic.